Well, thank you so much, Beth. This is a, a, a great opportunity to kind of follow up for uh, some of the talks that I've done for Science Cafe. This is my third one, so I've been to all of them now. I was at, down in Tacoma, over in Kirkland, and now here in Seattle, so I'm real excited uh, to be talking to you tonight. Um, if you've been to a talk or two that I've done before, I'm going to do a little bit of a review so you can kind of sit back and relax and, and realize that you've heard this stuff before. Um, but I kind of want to skip to the end because we've been doing this research since 2010. So we have several years of data. And in fact, I've got some undergraduates in the back there uh, that did, <laughs> and graduates, in the back there that actually processed most of these samples. So this project would not be possible if it weren't for the hours and hours and hours and hours that were um, put in the lab and in the field cl um, collecting all the data that we'll be presenting tonight. There is always an exam. No, it's their turn to give me one, so yeah, I'm ready. I'm a little nervous. Now I know how they feel. I forgot what that sensation was like. So again, I'm really excited to be here. This is where I work. I work in a pretty cool building. This is the Center for Urban Waters in the, Univers or the University of Washington Center for Urban Waters. Um, in this building is houses the city of Tacoma's environmental services. Um, the Puget Sound Partnerships upstairs and, and also upstairs uh, is the University of Washington Tacoma's laboratory uh, facilities. So we have three uh, labs that we own. We have two that we share. And we do a lot of research with respect to urban waters. So this is where I get to work. But if you guys notice at the bottom of this picture, a friend of mine was crossing over the bridge, and she caught us sampling. So this was 8 o'clock in the morning. I get these guys out of bed, and we actually have a dock that's right on our facility here, right on the Thea Foss Waterway, which is in Commencement Bay. And uh, she actually got us a picture here. It's at the bottom, of course, of us sampling, and I think that's kind of cool. And I'll talk a little bit about this little metal thing uh, in just a little bit. So uh, outline is pretty much the same as, uh, as before. I'm going to define the plastics and the plastics problem for you guys. Uh, I'll explain why I think that the research is important and kind of talk about some of the myths um, behind uh, uh, what we what we have been told, I think, through uh, articles and things. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about the field methods, which is actually the fun part. It's where we actually were trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together and coming up with some methods to share with uh, world researchers. Um, I'll share the results. So this is really exciting. <laughs> this is You guys are the first people to actually see this data crunched. I spent hours on this the past uh, couple of weeks taking, uh, as these guys know in the back, uh, about five th three inch three ring binders and getting all of the data kind of compiled and put together. So I'm really excited to show you guys this. So you guys are the first to see it. And then if we get some time, I only have 20 minutes. I could talk about this, obviously, for hours and hours and hours. I'm at a bar with a bunch of people that want to listen to me. So um, I'll probably save that to the end, or maybe you guys can ask me about um, prevention of plastic pollution a little bit later. So let's look at plastics and the plastics problem. So in 2008, the University of Washington hosted uh, an international meeting um, uh, that was sponsored by NOAA's Marine Debris Program. And one of the things that we wanted to do is get together, researchers get together and talk about what we knew about the plastic pollution problem in the ocean and what we didn't know. Okay, so there's a lot of pop news that was out there. You know, there's, there's plastic islands out there. There's trees growing on these islands. We could build on these <laughs> islands. It was really kind of crazy. And I had, you know, a very educated science instructors telling me that they saw, you know, a picture from NASA of this plastic island. And I know a lot of people that work for NASA, and they haven't seen it. So <laughs> this is where we, we got together. We was like, you know, let's really see what we know and what we don't know. And from that meeting, we actually came up with a size classification of what the different plastics are. And I want to be very clear that I'm not looking at macro plastics. I'm not looking at big pieces of plastic that you can pick up at the beach. I'm actually looking at something called a microplastic. So these are just a series of numbers. Um, and Really, I just want to focus in on, actually I have a little arrow here, uh, the size for microplastics. Microplastics are anything that ranges in size from 5 millimeters to 0.33 millimeters. So that's about the size of the width of a pencil. Okay, a little bit smaller, but that's, that's pretty good. And about the width of a pin. So when I talk about microplastics, you guys can see them. Um, you can actually, when you look at the water samples, you can actually see these plastic bits. We just use microscopes to actually pick these bits out of uh, the solution. 
And this is what microplastics look like right here. So they're kind of small. Um, a penny would be about this big here. So they're quite small. Um, and notice, if you can see, probably not very well in the back, guys, but there are some jagged pieces and there's some round pieces. Those jagged pieces used to be big pieces of plastic. And then the round pieces were probably manufactured to uh, be that size. So we're working with plastic that was made to be micro, micro, uh, micro in size and some that actually have broken down from larger pieces. So um, essentially, after the meeting in 2008, we were approached to basically figure out how much plastic's in the ocean. So Dr. Baker, who was approached originally, who runs the Center for Urban Waters, uh, the University of Washington's um, part, um, said, Julie, we need to figure out how much plastic's in the ocean. Well, that's a ridiculous question. <laughs> I can't figure that out. But really what they were asking us to do is to figure out methods that we could develop in our laboratory and we could share with other researchers that hopefully when we get together with a meet or get back together for a meeting again, that we could actually talk about the same things. Okay, we're talking about apples and apples instead of pineapples and kumquats. Do you like those? Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm here all night. How many folks have seen this picture? It's, it's quite sad, right? In fact, when I see this picture, it makes me kind of sad. And, and the first thing I see, of course, is the purple light lighter and lots of bottle caps. These are macroplastics. This is something that we have an emotional connection to. We see that these plastics killed this bird. You guys see that? Killed this bird, basically, this poor little, this was a chick, they're huge, was eating all of this plastic, put it in its belly, and he's like, oh, I'm so full. No nutrition, eventually died of starvation. So that's what we're seeing here. And this is usually what we see when we're talking about plastic pollution in the ocean. But again, we're looking at things that are smaller than that. Five to 0.33 millimeters in size, pretty small. And so what we didn't know is how much of that small Small pieces of plastic were in the ocean. And so we, w and we also didn't really know what the impact was. So at this, at this time, there was no standardized method for uh, collecting and identifying and even quantifying microplastics. We didn't know how much was in the ocean. Okay, we've heard about this soup, but no one really knew, and a couple of people have been doing the research. We didn't know what the spatial, how far it actually existed. If, if you saw it there yesterday, could I go there again in, in a couple of days and still see it there? Unfortunately, it doesn't stay in the same place. And we didn't really know the temporal. How long does it stay? Where does it move to? And then finally, what we didn't know, and we still don't know, and I'm not really comfortable unless you've got a little signature that said this came from Japan, that's a little soccer ball that a friend of mine had found off the coast. Um, we really don't know where it comes from, you know? We don't know where it comes from. Does it come from land? Does it come from the ocean? Does it get dropped? We don't know. From the air? We don't know. So we refined the task to quantify all plastic in the ocean to looking at three main types of plastic. And the reason why we chose those are those ones that are most manufactured, the most that you and I actually have contact with. Um, and those are uh, polyethylene, plastic bags. We all know about the plastic bags things. <laughs> um, polypropylene textiles, you know, nice little fleece. Um, and polyvinyl, polyvinyl chloride or PVC pipe, okay? Now the first two, actually float in water. The last one doesn't. In fact, I thought when I first started this research that all plastic float doesn't. Okay, so here's your homework assignment. Write this down. You guys are all going to go home at some point tonight, fill up a basin of water, and start throwing plastic bits into this water. And what you'll probably find is actually not a lot of plastic floats. And even some of these plastics that have a density that's less than water, if you fill it up with water, guess what happens? It starts to sink. So uh, that was kind of curious and something that I learned. But we had to add one more type of plastic to this list. The very first day, I got this piece of plastic in all of my samples, okay, or the very, that first sample. And I continue to get the majority of my samples have this plastic. Does anybody have a guess on what it is? Those would be one of these. So it'll be a wrapper, but another type of plastic. Styrofoam, yeah. So we actually had to add styrofoam to being one of the plastics that we look for in our samples because we see them everywhere. In fact, uh, you know, docks and any, it's, uh, it's not beer coolers, guys. It actually are docks that are degrading where we get the, the, the polystyrene or the um, 
styrofoam. So then we had to look at the ocean itself, and we had to think about the sample media. So as we were refining the our, our task that was given to us, we had to say, okay, how are we gonna, where are we gonna look? So we're gonna look in beach sediments, and so we used a protocol that the Port Townsend Marine Science Center came up with, and then we added a couple steps at the end to collect plastics from their discarded material. Um, we knew that plas not all plastic floats. In fact, I've been doing research in sediments for years, and some things that I thought were like, from the Kim wipes, you know, from that were on my slides, I actually figured out just about a year ago, I've been looking at plastic for years. There's plastic in sediments. So um, we've continued to collect uh, sediment, and I have some students that are working on um, dis disaggregating the plastic from the sediment. But our big focus was looking at the water column and looking at the floating debris, the stuff that's right at the surface. Um, and we needed to come up with a method to do that. So we refined our task to quantify certain types of plastic in specific locations uh, in the ocean to include the water column, especially the surface, the seafloor, and beach sediments. Okay. So why do we think that this uh, research is important? Well, how many folks have seen this fish? <laughs> that have read some articles about this problem. So this fish here, notice this has been uh, dissected. This comes from the Five Gyres Institute website. And notice here that there's plastic. Um, so as they dissected this fish, they found a lot of plastic content in their bellies. And that makes sense, because if I were a fish and I saw something that was looked like some shrimp, or if I looked at something that looked like plankton, I'm going to eat it. And so eat, just to eat, eat everything. And, and so this is not unusual. Um, but that probably isn't what killed this fish. In fact, this fish was actually caught live. So the issue with plastics in the ocean is that plastics themselves have a low reactivity. They're made to last for a very long time. They were created, plastics were created to replace natural resources. So they have a low reactivity and they can hang out in the environment for a long period of time. They do break down mechanically and through the sun and there's a couple of bacteria that like to eat the plastic. For the most part though, the plastic itself is going to remain in the, uh, in the environment for a very long time. They potentially, and I'm going to say the word potentially, can be deadly on all trophic levels. So all the way from uh, the birds, that the seabirds, all the way down to potentially plankton. I found out a couple years ago when I did this talk uh, from a friend that works at the University of Washington's uh, Seattle's oceanography department that she actually feeds her little plankton plastic. And she was feeding her plankton plastic to see what size they were eating. So even plankton consume plastic. We find plastic in jellyfish and sh shellfish, etc. So there's a potential that it could be deadly on all um, trophic levels. And even to this day, the most recent paper I've read, the scientists that are doing the research are still saying potential. They're not making that direct correlation. So though sometimes articles and reporters might say that this is a direct correlation to um, toxins or could p would be killing these microorganisms, I still have yet to read a paper that completely supports these ideas. It's probably true, and what's really exciting is that that research is happening right now. It's really cool. So if you want to get back into studies or if you're just getting into uh, uh, doing research as a, as a student, this is a really cool uh, project to look at. So potential uh, death on all trophic levels, false cessation, eating plastic, should probably eat some plastic a little bit more than the meatloaf I had earlier, um, <laughs> could potentially clog the gut and cause them to choke. And that's true even for microorganisms or, or, or small organisms. But the big one here is this word adsorption on the surface. Okay, Another homework assignment. So take your plastic that you guys are floating in the water and pull it out, dry it off, and then s put in a huge glug of oil. And then once you put that plastic back in that water, what do you think is going to happen to that oil? Science teachers. <laughs> It's going to adsorb to that surface. Okay, it's actually going to stick to it. Not absorb like, uh, like a sponge, but it's actually going to stick to the surface. Now, toxins that exist in the water are found to stick to the surface of plastic. An organism eats it, they're in the water. Potentially, and probably very true, that the transfer of toxins could be from either that plastic or it could just be because the fish are, are swimming around in the water. But I'll leave uh, the biologist to figure that one out. Okay, so field sampling. Jess, you're right there. There you are. 
your hair's all done. Are you watching? <laughs> so, so this is a this is one of the research students here. Uh, we're in Clackwood Sound, so very good at the pronunciation. Uh, we're here uh, rinsing off our uh, our net. This is the net that we use. But when I first was trying to figure out how to do some field sampling, um, I had a big plankton net and it had a stainless steel rim and it was huge. And I threw it in the water and guess what happened to it? it sunk. You know, and I'm trying to figure out how to strain samples off the surface. Uh, and so I would tie it to the back of the boat, and I'd yell to the captain, like, go faster, go slower, go faster, go slower. And when it went too fast, the net would fly out of the water. If it went too slow, it would sink, and it was really kind of funny. We laughed a lot. I made a lot of mistakes. But then I thought, you know, I bet you Noah's figured this out. So I went to their website, and I did a search on the Noah website, and I found this, these plans. And these are plans for something called a manta net. Like a manta ray, kind of float on the surface and they eat plankton. Well, I wanted to make an instrument or, or take this instrument that floats on the surface and it eats or it collects plastic um, and make it such that we could use it. One person could actually handle it and throw it in the water and, and do it. This, these plans, these things are about, there's several, you know, they could be up to 100 pounds on a 10-foot wingspan and there's no way that I was going to put that in the back of my truck because that's basically how we transfer all of our equipment. So I talked with my dad, and we had a beer, and, and I talked with my brother, and we actually put together, took those designs, and we came up with this instrument right here. It still is just a modified manta net. Notice that the wings here, there's wings. My dad specialized in fixing um, amphibious aircraft, so you know he knew about this. And, and uh, it's all aluminum, and you can just basically lift it with one hand. All you guys could do it, everyone here. Um, and there's a little flow meter to calculate how much water is going in here. And then this is just a plankton net, nothing special. I didn't make a new size or anything, just a plain old plankton net. But does anybody notice something that's wrong with this instrument? No, it actually kind of, it, it'll float fine, but it's actually some of the, some, uh, maybe the material that's used in the front of it. <laughs> Do you know what this is made out of? <laughs> I had a lot of yellow plastic at first, so <laughs> when I actually used this, so we changed that out with the stainless steel bridle, but that was pretty funny. I was like, yeah, here's this poly, they use that to tie down airplanes at the airport, and he's like, oh yeah, just take a, take a bunch of this, and I'm like, oh. Well, like I said, I made a lot of mistakes, uh, but we figured it out. This is what it looks like now. It's beautiful. It's actually in the back of my car. I just parked too far away to bring it. Um, and this is us. What time was this, guys? Six o'clock, I think we had to get up? Five o'clock. Yeah, this is five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Clock went sound, and they got up. Every morning, those guys are up, and they're ready to do some sampling. So it's kind of exciting. Well, we have a, a funny story to tell. If, uh, if you guys want to hear about that, ask it about it later about how fast the boat should go. <laughs> so this is what the samples look like, okay? Lots of, you know, it's a bunch of seaweed and, and material. And then we pour them into a, s a stack of sieves at five millimeters on the top and 0.33 on the bottom. And this is Jessica here uh, going through every single <laughs> uh, piece uh, that is in the sieve, rinsing it off, making sure that we don't take anything home that we don't want. Um, and sometimes it takes two minutes Oftentimes, it takes about a half hour to 45. Um, these are what the samples look like. Okay, All four of these samples came from the same location. And they also came at different times. These all came from a little urban waterway called the or, uh, Bay of Foss. Um, but you can see there's a lot of variability. This was after a big rainstorm in Tacoma. So there's everybody's grass clippings and stuff. And these were just, you know, this was high tide, this was low tide. So these are just the variability of samples. But if you kind of peek and squint your eyes, and I know that in the back you probably can't see, but there's white bits that are floating in these samples, okay? So when we first started this project, I would say I found plastic in every single sample. Now, I've got some zeros, which that's kind of cool. Um, but unfortunately, we find plastic at least in most every sample that we collect. So these are what they would look like from the field. Do you guys see these little circly things here? Does anybody know what these little circly things that are made out of hard plastic are called? Nurdles. They're nurdles, exactly. Some, some scientists would say, actually, no, ma'am. We'd like to call them pre-production plastic pellets. Um, but I like saying nurdles because it's way more fun. So yeah, those are nurdles. So <laughs> those are the little nurdles. Do a little YouTube search. There's a really cool uh, cartoon on nurdles. So we developed some methods. I'm not going to talk about the science, but I'll just tell you exactly what we did. 
We sieve it back in the lab. WPO stands for wet peroxide oxidation. Hydrogen peroxide, pour it into our sample, and essentially we let the, the peroxide oxidize off of the natural organic material. Plastic is actually organic, it's carbon and hydrogen, but the natural organic material gets uh, basically oxidized and, and essentially disappears. And then we put it in a, um, a funnel like this. This funnel is called a, you know, a density separation step, and it's actually, uh, you know, basically it sits in a funnel and everything that, um, that uh, has a density that's less than, and I kind of skipped a step, salt water. We add a bunch of salt to it so that the density is a little bit higher than just plain fresh water. And then we do a microscope and a evaluation. We actually go in there and we pick out all the samples, and then we do this gravimetric anal uh, analysis. That means we weigh it, okay? <laughs> so we weigh it, and we come up with a concentration based on how much water actually flew through the net uh, and what the mass was of that piece of plastic. So if it looks like plastic, it is plastic. I'm sorry, I only have a picture myself. I should find more students. Um, but this is basically, we just take how many hours? Hundreds of hours picking out bits of plastic from our samples. And we have over 400 samples um, that the students have worked on over the years. So this was like the very first, you know, we have like five of these now filled with um, plastic samples. So just to give you perspective, this is what we're picking out. Okay, I don't have any nurdles in this picture, and sometimes they're even this small. Sometimes we're actually picking out little fibers from your fleece jackets. <laughs> we see a lot of that. Actually, it's mostly from the line that ships use. Um, this, uh, this slide, just so you know, this is about 100 micrometers, okay? So it's about a 0.1 millimeter. Uh, these are the nurdles, okay? And I just, um, this is actually kind of an old slide from an old talk, but this is basically Puget Sound. Commencement Bay, and this is the Chesapeake Bay. And as what we wanted to show here is, I actually uh, partner with uh, uh, NOAA over in Maryland, and and they send us samples from the Chesapeake. They look pretty much the same. And when I get them from San Francisco, they look pretty much the same. So uh, you know, our plastic is not quite you know very unique. Okay. All right. This is the cool part. <laughs> this is what I'll just go finish up after, right? This is the last thing I want to share with you guys. So the current and future work, um, I c again, I, d I don't do anything. I just get to talk and, um, and get to share this stuff with you. This is the cool part. But really, I could not do any of this without all of the hard work of all of our undergraduates and partnerships with other groups. Uh, the B is Bellarmine um, Preparatory School. So high school students actually go out and do sampling um, and share their results with us. North Seattle Community College um, have done some work with their research uh, program, Sound Experience. I get to hang out on a sailboat, and sometimes for several days to, to get plastic. But they collect uh, samples for us, and they actually, uh, uh, we actually process in the lab. The Sea Education Adventure off of Woodby Island, not to be confused with the Woods Hole Sea. Um, Jason Lee Middle School in Tacoma, um, NOAA's Marine Debris Program, and countless undergraduates from either my classes or research students from the University of Washington Tacoma's Environmental Science and Environmental Studies Program. So these are all our samples. So we actually, this is kind of supposed to focus on Puget Sound, but I also wanted to show you that I got to go do some sampling n up north on Vancouver Island. We work here anyways on other projects. Um, so this is Vancouver Island. These are some sampling that we've taken around Vancouver Island. But as you can see, the majority of the sampling happens in Puget Sound. Um, the red is from all the adventurous sampling. Um, the blue are from the sea sampling, and there's some that are up here, the rivers and stuff. And then the, the orange are basically all the University of Washington sampling. And so there are actually many more. I only I have, you know, about 200 and something up here right now, but I have many more samples. Uh, but I just wanted to show you that we've got a pretty good distribution of um, samples, even here in Hood Canal. So pretty comfortable. And then I just wanted to just kind of focus in a little bit and show you that we get to go up and sail around um, the San Juan Islands and then down in south and, and go through all these bays here too. So we've got a really good distribution, even little Lake Washington and some up here on the rivers. So I'm going to show you some graphs, but I will take you through it slowly. All right. So notice here the x-axis is the volume of seawater. So this is how much water actually goes through the net. Okay, the y-axis shows you what the solids are in the water. So folks have seen water before, right, out in the sound. Sometimes it's clear, sometimes it's cloudy. The cloudy stuff are the solids that are in the, the water. And notice that as we increase 
the volume of water that we're sampling in the Puget Sound, if I actually put a, what we call a trend line here, okay, if I actually try to see what the best fit line is, notice it's down here, it's kind of a horizontal line. So what this is showing you is that for the most part, the majority of the samples that we collect throughout the Puget Sound, no matter if it's 800,000 liters or if it's 10,000 liters of water, that for the most part, we get less than two grams of solid, okay? And that's not even the plastic, okay? Now, we would expect that if you collect more water, you should get more solids, and that's not true. Because the ocean environment is very dynamic, okay? If there's heavy rainstorms, then there's going to be a lot of material in the water, okay? Especially if you live in a coastal area, okay? Um, if there isn't a lot of rain and there's a high pressure system, you might have some clear water, okay? Well, unless plankton grow, but that's another thing. So we would expect that if you collect more water, that you would have more solids. And I put this red line to show you what the trend should be. And this is not what we get. Okay, so that's kind of cool. We've got cleanish water, at least on the surface. Okay, now notice there's some, there's some peaks here, and I can tell you these were major rain events that probably happened in, in Tacoma, because uh, that's where we get most of our samples, because we live there, and we have boats there. But this is kind of neat. So what I did is I took all of the solids, so I took the y-axis of solids, and I put it on the x-axis, and this is going to be just kind of um, my control. Okay, so as we get an increase in the amount of solids, we should see possibly an increase in the amount of plastic if there is a one-to-one -one correlation. Now, what I have here is basically how much uh, the mass of the microplastics that are in the solids. Now, notice here that in the x-axis, this is a 45 here. We only have three here. So we essentially have had a maximum of 2.76 grams of plastic for about five grams of dry mass. Okay, so that's the big spike here. But notice the average amount of plastic or mass of plastic that we get from our samples is less than a gram. Okay, now that's good news. That's great news, but it's not the best news. Hopefully we could get zero. That's kind of exciting. Now here's where it kind of gets a little bit, just stay with me here. So here's the dry mass again. This is going to be basically our control. And now what I did is I plotted the amount of microplastics versus the amount of dry mass. Okay, so I wanted to come up with the percentage for you. And notice that you'll have to, to knock the zero or the decimal point over one to get the true percentage. This is that same plastic or that same plastic mass that was way up there that was 56%. Well, it was two grams out of five grams of plastic. That was a big piece of plastic we found in some dry mass. So it was only maybe one, maybe two pieces of plastic that gave us this. So these big high hitters, okay, where the percentages are about 40% and 30% and 20, happen at very low masses. Again, we probably brought the net over and caught a couple of pieces of plastic and maybe no dry mass, a very little dry mass. Um, so that's kind of cool. And notice that the majority, okay, so the average, I should say, uh, percentage of plastic is about 5%. And that compares to a lot of coastal bays throughout the United States. The median, and the median just means that 50% of all the samples are below this line, and 50% of the samples are above the line, or half. Um, the median is 2.1%. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. Again, it's not perfectly clean. But being in an urban environment, it's actually not bad. And, and these, uh, this is basically our N. That just means how many, um, how many samples I use or how many... Uh, variables, I, or not variables, how many samples I use to plot this graph. And we have more that are still in process. So this is kind of cool. And these numbers here, these percentages here, actually correlate with other bays um, that are doing uh, plastic research also. So that's kind of good. So this is kind of what we've been doing. Where we're heading is we're actually going to continue to correlate and try to um, compare plastic amounts to different variables like tides. Um, we're going to look at um, different seasons and we're going to be looking at not only tides, but we'll also look at like, oh, I'm sorry, I just said that, uh, also seasons. And also kind of look at different properties, looking at the salinity of the water, et cetera, to try to, to see if there is another correlation to uh, other physical properties of the ocean.
So of course I couldn't do this without Jaseo. The marine uh, debris program um, funded uh, the research. We're finally done with the funding. We're writing everything up. So you guys in the back, you need to come back in and help me write this paper. Um, and also I couldn't do this without my research team. So this is, uh, well that's me. I don't know why I put myself up there. I couldn't have done this without Dr. Baker and uh, Dr. Foster. We all work together. And a series of research students. This is Portia Lee. This is, uh, God, <laughs> Jennings, Michelle Jennings. This is Chris LaRock, Heather Jennings. There you are, Jess, down the, you see that? There's Jessica, um, Caitlin and Tina here. We have Lauren Reitz. We have Troy Album. And finally, John. And also, um, Alex in the back, he also helped us out too. There's countless other students. Uh, and tons and tons of research students have come in and actually picked plastic and contributed to this data. So that's all I have to share with you. I'm looking forward to your questions um, after a 10 minute break, correct? Yeah. Okay. So let's have a huge round of applause for, applause for Julie. Thank you so much, that was a great talk.